Number 10, Deadpool. Deadpool has gone through phases where he was fully cured of his power set and even pretty once more in the comics, like back during Daniel Way's Deadpool run, looking completely normal but without his healing factor. But the most startling shift when it comes to Deadpool's appearance has to be between his on screen adaptations. That's right, we're talking about the comparison between Deadpool's cinematic debut in the X Men Origins Wolverine film and his own self titled film franchise. Although, oddly enough, both both roles feature him played by Ryan Reynolds. The two adaptations could not be more different. Thankfully in Deadpool 2, Wade manages to fix Cable's temporal dial. Using this device to time travel, Wade is not only able to save Vanessa, who initially died at the beginning of that film, but is also able to clean up the timelines by killing the previous version of himself, who is also known as Weapon 11. It should also be noted that in X-Men Origins Wolverine, Deadpool appeared fully as a villain, as opposed to the lovable mess of an anti-hero we've come to know him as within his own film franchise. Number 9, Rakil. Rakil. La, la, la. I never know how to say this name, but I'm pretty sure it's like Rakil. How do you say scroll names? That's the question. For some reason, probably because she had been gone so long, Rakil, aka the Scroll Empress, aka Emperor Doric the Eighth slash Hulkling slash Teddy Altman's grandmother, was completely unrecognized when she returned. Rakil was revealed to be alive and well, and also sleuthing it up as she impersonated Tanalt the Pursuer, an elite member of the Kree forces, and apparently. Rakul had been impersonating Tanalt so long she had in essence created her persona and basically was her. Rakul had actually been plotting and planning in secret, putting in place all the pieces to bring together the Kree and Skrull Empire, uniting them in an alliance in order to ensure her grandson was the one to rule over the now allied empire, as we saw in Empire. That's the name of the event, so not to be redundant. It was an empire, but it spelled empire with the why because it's a whole other thing. And yet when she was revealed in that event to be the one revealed as the scroll pretending to be Tanalt, many Marvel fans actually needed to crack open their comic history books and review just who exactly she was, with many people mistaking her for Varonki, the scroll queen. But yes, this is Rakul. She was believed to have died when the scroll homeworld perished along with her daughter Princess Anel, as their world was devoured by Galactus. She made her first appearance in the Fantastic Four original series in issue 206 and was believed to have perished in issue 257. But she didn't! She was still alive and then she came back years later and everyone went, who is that? What? Veronki? What? Not Veronki. Two different people. Number 8, Craven the Hunter. You might think you recognize Craven, but do you really? After all, the current Craven that you've seen turning up in the current Beyond storyline of the Amazing Spider-Man series is actually none other than Craven's last son. Well, his last clone son, anyway. This clone of Craven was given the name of Last Son after he hunted down all his other brothers, his other clone brothers, who had also been trained by Sergei Kravinov, the Craven himself. As such, this clone of Craven was named his true heir, and since then has also taken up the mantle of Craven the Hunter. So while he may look like Craven, albeit a younger version of him, this Craven the Hunter is not actually the original. So I guess this is a character that you would recognize but in so doing, you'd be wrong, which means I guess you didn't really recognize him then, did you? This version of Craven made his first appearance in the current run of The Amazing Spider-Man, which started in 2018, first appearing back in issue 16 as The Last Son. Number 7, Zemnu. Zemnu made his first appearance in Journey into Mystery in issue number 62. We learned that Zemnu was actually a prisoner and a criminal who was retrieved and accidentally revived by a human and electrician named Joe Harper. Zemnu would go on to be become known as Zemnu the Living Hulk and would also prove to be a powerful cosmic, psionic, and all around bizarre enemy to the Hulk and the Hulk family in time. Initially, he clashed with the original superhero powerhouse team known as the Defenders. Zemnu in his first appearance has brownish or reddish fur, but currently has reappeared in the comics with white fur, making him look kind of like a space yeti. You may not recognize him because you forgot him, or because he's just so weird, or it could be just because of of this change when it comes to, you know, his overall fur color. But yeah, he's got different, I guess he dyed his fur? I don't know. What happened there? Number 6, Norman Osborn. Well, you might currently recognize Norman Osborn in terms of his appearance, when it comes to his actions and his alignment, 
You might not. And in modern comics, Norman has also gone through a couple dramatic redesigns and makeovers in recent history. At one point, Norman gets plastic surgery to completely change his facial appearance, reinventing himself as Mason Banks and becoming the head of Alchemax. There's even an unmasked point where we were all kind of like, wait, who's that? And then he's like, I changed my face, but it's me, Norman Osborn, aka also Mason Banks. He also has been the head of Hammer and his own Dark Avengers, and for a time posed as their version of Iron Man, tarnishing the mantle of Iron Patriot. And more recently, a depowered Norman bonded with the Carnage symbiote, allowing himself to use the Goblin Serum once more, but ultimately being driven insane by that whole experience and believing himself to actually be prime carnage host and serial killer Kalidas Cassidy. Now sane again however and seemingly purified by the Sin Eater, currently in the comics, Norman is on a path of redemption, having gained a new lease on life and being cured of his usual villainous intentions. Or so it would seem. I never trust Norman, but that's what's up currently. 10. Big Wheel. Wheel! Hey! Wanna be a villain? Great. Just hire another guy to make you a big wheel with machine guns and rocket launchers on it so that you can ride around in it. It's that easy! That's what Jackson Wheel did. Can you guess what he called himself? When he first appeared, Big Wheel used his big wheel to chase and try to kill Rocket Racer while he was mid-fight with Spider-Man. Big Wheel wasn't even facing Spider-Man one-on-one. Just before he was about to get crushed, Spider-Man pulled Racer out of the way and Big Wheel drove right off the side of a building and right into the Hudson River ending both Jackson Wheel and his Big Wheel. All of this because Rocket Racer had some blackmail. Number 9. Crime Master Why are there so many people who have no powers of any kind on Spider-Man's enemy list? This guy just walks around with a gun. That's it! He's another one of the many crime bosses in Marvel's New York. And I guess in that respect he chose a very fitting name. He is a criminal and he has sorta of mastered it. Usually, he employs others to do his dirty work for him. Although, he did partner with the Green Goblin for a short while before being shot and killed. He has come back from death multiple times under multiple different identities, which kinda made it hard for fans to follow who he is, even if they cared in the first place. Number 8. The Living Brain Okay, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but isn't a brain just kinda living by default? Like, if it's an alive human being, isn't it technically a living brain? This guy isn't living or brain, I'm so confused! Okay, I'm gonna cut Marvel some slack here because the living brain is actually older than almost all of the main Marvel villains. He came before even the Green Goblin. He was created as a machine that could solve any problem, but malfunctioned after two guys got in a little scuffle and it went on a rampage until it was stopped by Spider-Man. It's been used by other smaller criminals, but was always stopped by Spider-Man, but hey, it eventually found steady work as a lab assistant and even saved the spit on a few occasions. So, there's that at least. Number 7. Big Man. I ain't got the facilities for that big man. He really didn't. Frederick Foswell was a reporter at the Daily Bugle and, um, well he was a little guy. Except when he wasn't. You see, Foswell was a master of disguise and he used a costume that gave him a nice little height boost in order for him to become aptly named Big Man. From this stature, he can now ride the adult roller coasters, reach the top shelf, and be the head of the crime gang, the Enforcers. Spider Man works with the guy though, so unsurprisingly, he was caught and incarcerated for a time. But Jonah gave him his job back afterwards, which is nice. He ended up dying in front of a bullet to save Jonah, so at least he wasn't all bad. Number 6 Black Fox. This one is a little sad. See, Black Fox is basically just a jewel thief who has had a very long career seeing how he is now an old man. Just a regular jewel thief? Well, why is this a problem for Spider-Man? It's not. It's really not. But you see, the problem for Spider-Man is that being an old man, Black Fox heavily reminds Peter of his Uncle Ben, which meant that Peter couldn't help but have a soft spot for the guy. He would let Black Fox go multiple times. I mean, I get it. I respect it. But Peter realized his weakness and stopped easing up on the old guy, finally throwing him in the slammer. While he isn't exactly threatening to anyone, he is the mentor of Black Cat, which does give him some notoriety. Number 5. Mirage What's the best way to stop a robber? Oh, oh, I, I know, I know, I know! Uh, drop a chandelier on him! Wow, um, yeah, I guess that works. Mirage is a robber, but not just any robber. Oh, no, 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 no. He and his gang had a specialty for robbing weddings. Honestly. 
Who's expecting that? I mean, I wouldn't be. I'd be so surprised, I just, I just give him my money, you know? He made a bad choice though, when he decided to rob the wedding of Ned Leeds and Betty Brant, where none other than Peter Parker was in attendance. Peter used his web shooters to turn off all the lights and don his spider suit. The day was saved when Spider-Man dropped the whole chandelier on Mirage, defeating him. Ouch. Number four, the spot. Could you imagine that the first time you reveal yourself to a hero, they just drop on the floor laughing at you? And on top of that, it's in front of Kingpin, one of the biggest crime lords in Marvel. It would be super embarrassing, except when you totally win and make them look dumb. Way to go, man. The spot. Yes, that's his name. Had the power to create interdimensional portals, big and small, which he used to defeat Spider-Man and Black Cat the first time they encountered him. But only the first time. See, the spot can only create as many portals as he has spots on his body, throwing them wherever he wants until he runs out, which he did in the second encounter with Spidey. And then he lost, pretty badly. He's appeared here and there since, but he never really posed a threat to anyone, like anyone at all. Oh, uh, but he did create the failed group, the Spider-Man Revengeance Squad, with other minor characters that lasted like uh, two seconds. Hold up, I gotta stop you right there. In a 10 werewolf by night. The first time we've seen Moon Knight in the comics actually wasn't in his own series, but rather Werewolf by Night number 32. He faced off against Jack Russoff, aka Werewolf by Night, making Russoff his enemy. However, technically, Moon Knight was the villain in this scenario, hence its placement at number 10. Jacob Russoff is a werewolf, but unlike his dad, also a werewolf, Jack could control when and where he would transform, not just under a full moon. He had much more control over his abilities in werewolf form as well, except for when there was a full moon, because that's when Jack would be at his strongest, but also completely out of control, which is a concept that sounds a lot like a D&D character. His superpowers include werewolf physiology, along with superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, stamina, a healing factor, and of course, a hairy body packed with a nasty set of teeth and killer claws, something the ladies love. Coming in at number nine, we have Starro the Conqueror, specifically the version seen in James Gunn's 2021 film, The Suicide Squad. Found by American astronauts during the early days of the Cold War merely drifting through space, Starro was imprisoned and tortured for 30 years by the American government on the island Corto Maltese when it was discovered that Starro possessed incredible telepathic mind control powers that the government seek to learn how to weaponize. Although he eventually he had to be taken down by the Suicide Squad when his anger at being imprisoned caused him to go on a rampage, Starro's story wound up being a tragic one, as his sad last words were, I was happy, floating, staring at the stars. Rest in peace, Starro. Hopefully there's lots of stars to look at in big, mysterious kaiju heaven. And it ain't Dave. Dave's origin is unknown as of yet, but it is heavily inferred that he was like the other thousands of robots in the series created by humans to serve a certain task. However, the robots became advanced enough to form their own conscious thoughts, so of course they revolted and killed off the entire human race. It was shown that Dave was one of the robots that served in combat and also helped fight off numerous alien races, and after the wars, robots seemed to act entirely like humans, adopting their culture and their way of life. Dave had a wife named Sally who he actually later divorced because apparently even robot girlfriends are unbearable, and a son called Scotty. However, he is now a, uh, a nobody working at, as an office drone, which only makes him more of a villain, despite being the protagonist of the story. Because like, given that he wiped out the entire human race, I think it's safe to say that he's a villain. And it's seven, Dead Zone. There are a few characters more 90s than Dead Zone, but he has his appeal. Dead Zone sort of emulates the classic Iron Man villain whiplash with his electrical whips, but he's less a mercenary than just an ideological warrior. He seeks to punish sinners by lashing them to death that it has him run afoul with Moon Knight. Dead Zone first appeared in Moon Knight's solo title and is pretty evenly matched for the character. When Moon Knight tried to take him down with his adamantium, Dead Zone catches it and then turns it around on him. There there's very little on the wiki about him, and honestly, I don't know what else I could say about him, but he, he's trying to do what Moon Knight does, but going about it in an absolutely abysmal way. Like, come on, bro. Really? Whips? Like, I get that they're OP in, like, the Spider-Man PS4 game, but seem seriously underpowered in real life, or in comic books, unless they need them for plot, or you're into that kind of thing. 
Coming in at number six, we have the Court of Owls. Introduced in one of my personal favorite Batman arcs, the Court of Owls is an ancient conspiracy that has controlled Gotham City from the shadows for hundreds of years. Originally believed to just be a myth by Batman, given that he had investigated their existence as a kid after the murder of his parents, the Court eventually revealed themselves when Bruce Wayne committed to super modernizing Gotham City. With multiple assassins that are seemingly a mortal in their employ, and even some members of the court itself appearing to be human-owl hybrids, there's still a lot we don't know about the Court of Owls, and I for one can't wait to find out what we'll learn next. Number 5. Violator Violator was always an indie villain that haunted my nightmares as a kid. Violator is the clown character with blue face paint from the Spawn film who was played by John Leguizamo. I love John Leguizamo, but this role, wow. Also, John Leguizamo and everything is kind of wow, it's great. Not only did he crush it, but it also felt like he kind of crushed me and my soul under the terror of the Violator. The Violator in the comics is a Spawn villain who is one of the most powerful demons of hell. He often focuses on getting Spawn to use his necro powers, trying to get him sent back to hell to become Malabolgia's servant faster, but also serves to prepare Hell Spawn for joining the army of Satan. Of course, that doesn't mean that he enjoys his job, and he often seeks to try and undermine his master. Violator is basically immortal as well. Despite dying many times, he's often reanimated shortly after in hell, only to return to torment Spawn some more. Yay. And at four, Midnight Man. Originally a collector of art, Anton Mogart would commit robberies at the stroke of midnight to build his collection. When Moon Knight stops him, he seemingly drowns in a river, but instead, he ends up becoming deformed by the waste found within the sewers. Then he goes insane and starts collecting trash, and teams with Bushman to defeat their sworn enemy. When Midnight Man finds out he's dying from cancer, he decides to find his son, hoping that he can share some of his final moments with him. Mogart does what he can to stop his son from turning to a life of crime like he once did, and in the wake of his death, he becomes the hero Midnight. It didn't last, and he ended up becoming a cyborg for the Secret Empire. Which while sounding bad, I think it would be kinda cool, like, to be a cyborg. Like, as long as I still have, like, my free will and my programming isn't controlling me, because that just doesn't sound like fun. Like, I want to be able to turn my arm into a giant cannon. That'd be great. Someone tries to mug me, I'm just like, sorry. <laughs> Coming in at number 3, we have Duella Dent. Now, given her last name, you'd assume that Duella was Harvey Dent, aka Two-Face's daughter. And that was her original backstory, with her being given the name Duella because Two-Face was disappointed that he didn't have twins. However, Duella's origins are actually a lot more mysterious, as in subsequent appearances, she's claimed to be the daughter of the Joker, the Penguin, Catwoman, Scarecrow, Riddler, and even Doomsday. Given the extreme, extreme unlikelihood that Duella could somehow be all of these villains' daughters, this crazy killer's origins may still be a mystery, but definitely don't make her any less dangerous. Penultimately, in number two, Overlord. A super-powered crime lord who operates out of Chicago, he is the archenemy of the Savage Dragon and the leader of Vicious Circle. There have been three people who had this mantle though, Antonio Seghetti, who I keep trying to call Antonio Spaghetti, Victor Nixon, and Flash Mercury. Antonio Seghetti grew up in Chicago around the time of Al Capone and became fascinated with the Mafia way of life. When his sister was being a in an alleyway, the eight-year-old Segetti stabbed the man responsible and claimed his first victim. This act led to a life of crime and he soon came under the wing of a man who would become Octopus, whilst also rising up through the ranks of the Mafia. Once he had reached a position of authority in the Mafia, Segetti vowed that he would never lose his power, but his position came under threat when a superpowered freak became the dominant figures in Chicago's crime sector. Seeking resources and methods with which to cement his leadership position in Chicago, Segetti forced alliances with the nation of Lieberheim and Cyberdata organizations, and as well became Overlord, because that's what you do. And finally, in the number one, Hunter's Moon. Dr. Batter was born in Luxor, Egypt to two doctors and was an excellent student throughout his life, eventually becoming a doctor as well. He grew to become a very rational and serious person who didn't believe in any higher entities, despite still attending prayer and studying the Quran and the Hadith. This all changed when he was attacked by vampires and left to die on the streets, at which point he met the Egyptian moon god Khonshu. Dr. Batter survived and became a worshipper of Khonshu, who fancied himself the god's second highest priest, and opposite of Mark's Spectre. 
After learning that Moon Knight had taken in vampires under his protection, Dr. Batter terrorized the Nightwalkers to get his attention. Hunter's Moon eventually confronted Moon Knight, chastised them for taking in enemies of Khonshu, and expressed his intentions to correct him. Dr. Batter beat Moon Knight and invaded the Midnight Mission to kill the vampires, but Spectre recovered and knocked him unconscious after attacking him from behind. But you know what, after beating him, I'm not even gonna call it, that's kinda shady. I respect it. Number 10, Super Scrawl. Clurt might be recognizable when it comes to his character design, which admittedly has not changed that much over the years. But when it comes to his alignment, you might be somewhat surprised to learn where he is now, from where he started. Super Skrull Clurt made his first appearance in Fantastic Four issue 18. Once again, the Skrulls attempted to invade Earth and planned on defeating the FF, this time with their secret weapon the Super Skrull, who seemed to possess all of the Fantastic Four's powers. Unfortunately, Mr. Fantastic and the team realized that these powers were likely not Super Skrull's own, and suspected, in fact, that they were delivered to him from the Skrull homeworld. They used a device to jam the signal that was giving Clurt his powers, defeating him. Currently in the comics, Clurt serves Emperor Hulkling, and was for a time one of his trusted advisors. Clurt, however, was also the one who killed Hulkling's foster mother. Recently in Empire Aftermath, Clurt felt so awful about his past that he actually offered his life to the Emperor. Hulkling refused to accept it though, instead preferring to make Clurt work in the area of diplomacy so that he might make amends for all the lives that he had taken in times of war. He was like, no. Instead, you gotta save lives, and hopefully that'll make up for it. You can't just die on me, Clurt. Number 9. Hell's Bells Hell's Bells was a group of villains who were all female mutants. The team was originally assembled by Cyber, who trained all of its members and consisted of Shrew, Briquette, Flame, Tremolo, and Vague. When Shrew betrayed them by testifying against them in order to get immunity for herself, the Hell's Bells banded together in an attempt to get revenge on her for betraying them. Eventually, they would be successfully taken into custody by X-Factor. Following the events of M-Day and Decimation, all team members save Briquette found themselves completely depowered. They still have operated as criminals in the comics, appearing in the Children of Adam series most recently, but they were a lot less scary because they had to rely on equipment and gadgets in place of, you know, their own powers. Even without their powers, the team mainly stuck together though, minus Briquette and obviously Shrew. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want even more lists about Marvel villains you might not recognize or something in that realm, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Silver Samurai. While Silver Samurai looks much the same in the comics as he always has, not every iteration of him has been mm, so recognizable. We've seen him turn up here and there on Krakoa recently, he seems to enjoy watching and participating in the friendly single combat matches in the quarry, and in modern comics, he's recognizable. But how about in modern film? Well, Silver Samurai might not be a main character in Fox's mutant universe, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. He actually made an appearance in the 2013 film, The Wolverine. But although here he also seemingly looked the same, when it came to his armor at least, he couldn't be further from his comic book counterpart in actuality. That's because Silver Samurai here was an adamantium robot whom Wolverine had to battle against. Yeah. Yeah, they made Kenny Yokio Harada robot armor. He was at least piloted by Ikiro Yoshida, who was obviously that film's version of Ken's own father in the comics. So, at least there was a little bit of a thing, but still, he wasn't even a person. He was just robot armor. Like, rude. <laughs> Ken is a whole person, okay? It's not just armor. Number seven, forearm. Forearm is Michael McCain. Originally, Michael was part of Strife's Mutant Liberation Front. He was one of the founding members, but would end up defeated by those that fought against him. Despite generally being on the side of the villains, Forearm was also welcomed onto the mutant island nation of Krakoa, where he could have a fresh start for himself. He accepted the offer and would end up joining S.W.O.R.D. and being seen as a member of Magic's Dark Riders, who I think should get their own book. However, on Krakoa, he looks a bit different from his initial appearance, where he decidedly was showing a lot more Forearm and had much less shirt. Forearm's mutant power is that he has four arms. Get it? Get it? His forearms. And now he wears shirts. Good for you, forearm. 
good for you. Although you can also not wear a shirt. You can you can not wear a shirt if you don't want to wear a shirt. Like I'm not gonna pressure anyone to wear shirts if they don't want to, or vice versa. I'm not gonna pressure anyone to like not wear a shirt if they're like, I like my shirt, let me keep my shirt. But I do like his new design as well. His new outfit is pretty cool. Number six, Thanos. Thanos might look very similar to his initial appearance in the comics and also looks quite similar on the big screen, but he's seen a pretty big change when it comes to what he's up to recently. In the comics, that is. In the MCU, he's mainly dead and gone. But there is a chance, perhaps, that he could return? Who knows? Not only have we now met Star Fox or Eros in the MCU, but in the comics, Thanos has become the new Prime Eternal, and as such, their new leader. That's right, this guy just went from being the baddest supervillain around to leader of a superhero team. Although we'll have to see where the Eternals' alignment is in the comics, following the events of Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals War, because that's probably gonna be crazy. Also, I don't even know what the Eternals is really doing in that mix, but I'm here for it. I'm here to check that out. Number five, Rhino. Rhino was given a completely new look for his appearance in the second Amazing Spider-Man film. Honestly, Rhino is a hard villain to do in live action, I feel like, so I'm not surprised with the direction that they went with, but also, what a weird direction to go in for that character, considering what they're actually supposed to be like in the comics. In the comics, Rhino is Alexei Sistovich, who is genetically altered and then bonded to a suit of armor that increases his strength and durability. Basically, he's given like a mechanical Rhino skin but like the skin. The armor was modeled after a rhinoceros as they are known in nature for being relentless when it comes to their assault and extremely hard to defeat due to their tough hide. Rhino, however, has never been known for being very smart, which makes him fairly easy to defeat usually, which seems to be the same idea when it came to his cinematic counterpart. However, the whole design for this character was definitely different than the comic book counterpart, whose armor was much less neck-like or robotic and is more like just the tough hide of a rhino. Really, he kind of just looks like a guy in a rhino suit in the comics. Also, Alexi is just super jacked in the comics, and his cinematic counterpart with didn't seem so Jack. He was just like a guy in a suit. Of course, Alexi does get a lot of his jackedness as well from his whole rhino thing, but he also, I think, was jacked still to begin with. I'm pretty sure. He's just more jacked. Number four, Legion. Legion has a new look in X-Men Onslaught Revelation. This one-shot is kind of like the bookend for the Way of X limited series, if you were checking that out. Which I personally haven't read all of, but I will say the parts of it that I have read have been strictly excellent, so I would recommend Way of X to anyone that's interested. If you like the idea of pondering the why in life and beliefs, and you enjoy philosophical prose, this is really a great series for you. In Onslaught Revelation, Nightcrawler, Legion, Pixie, and Dust come together to try and defeat the resurrected Onslaught, who has been slowly returning with each resurrection, residing as pieces in the minds of all mutants. In order to help in the fight against Onslaught, Legion makes his mind a safe space for all mutants to come through, in essence also fully connecting with Krakoa and kind of becoming a sort of hive mind if necessary. As such, he gets a redesign, though he still gets to keep the wild shape of his hair that we've all come to recognize so well and that I've really come to love. Legion moving forward after the defeat of Onslaught will also keep this look as he becomes the newly created religion's church. That's right, Legion is the church. He's the building. In essence, people can come into his mind to worship, find community, and seek sanctuary. It's like a nice safe space for people to come and just like be and feel good. It's awesome. I love that Legion is the church. I just think that's great. Number three, Donald Blake. Donald Blake ended up becoming a villain recently in the comics, which is a pretty big change for a guy who was once also the mighty hero Thor. Donald Blake used to be Thor's human form, but in reality was kind of his own person, or he kind of ended up becoming his own person. He was created by Odin to be a human host for Thor, but after Thor died at the hands of the serpent, Blake became separated from Thor and became his own separate entity. Eventually, he would end up going to the Enchantress for help, only for her to use him to make her own villainous creature referred to as the Keep. Basically, she, she killed Donald Blake and then used his blood to make the Keep, and we haven't seen the Keep in a while, but I'm sure 
he's out there somewhere. After Amora and the Keep were defeated by Thor, Blake was laid to rest, living on as a disembodied head in a dream world that was crafted for him. Well, living on is a person in the dream world, but he was just a disembodied head. But he was asleep, so he was dreaming. Eventually, though, Blake came to realize that this world wasn't real, and awoke from his dream, seeking revenge on all Thors across the multiverse for what had happened to him. And don't worry, he, he wasn't just a head then. He, he, got a, he had a body then. He would end up being defeated by 616 Thor in the end, and then made into the God of Lies, as per Thor's brother Loki's suggestion. Thor was like, what do we do with this guy? We shouldn't kill this guy. He's Donald Blake. Loki's like, nah, let's make him the god of lies. Seems to fit considering everything Donald Blake has been through. Number two, Taskmaster. Taskmaster is Anthony Masters and is known for being an unstoppable foe. He can master pretty much any skill he can observe. Some would say he's a taskmaster, which makes him a deadly opponent. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we were also introduced to Taskmaster, but the character was changed somewhat for the film in which they were introduced, Black Widow. Instead, Antonia Drakov, the daughter of General Drakov, the man behind the Red Room, was Taskmaster. When Black Widow left the Red Room and became an Avenger, she believed she had killed Drakov, sadly also having to kill his daughter, who basically led them to their target. She was a casualty of the explosion, intended to kill Drakov himself. Instead, Antonia was actually badly injured and ended up surviving, but her face was permanently scarred. She then became Drakov's weapon, having studied the moves of the Avengers and having their fighting styles basically uploaded into her brain, allowing her to mimic all their various moves and making her a hard opponent for Black Widow to defeat. Quite different from the comic book version, but still really cool and badass as an alternate version of the character, I think. Number one. Cyber. Cyber has come a long way when it comes to his look in the comics. Granted, Cyber has also come back a lot of times, so I guess it kind of makes sense that he would look different. He made his first appearance in Marvel Comics Presents in issue 85 in the 90s, where he was introduced to us as a cyborg appearing Wolverine villain who was hired by General Koi, another enemy of Logan's. Back then, he was just a smile and a coat with a hat on. Currently, however, his design is much different, and he doesn't even go by the name Cyber anymore, instead being known as Hornet in the comics in his newest body. Starting us off into number 10, Vlad Plasmius. In the world of Danny Phantom, there exists a select few individuals with the ability to transition between a human form and a ghost form. One of these is Danny Fenton, the other is a female clone of him named Danny Fenton, but the third is probably the most important one, Vlad Plasmius, also known as Vlad Masters, Amity Park's mayor, and Danny's dad's old college friend who is in love with his wife. Yeah. Vlad is secretly a human ghost hybrid, actually the first to come into existence, following an accident that was caused by a college experiment that he was working on with Jack and Maddie, which are Danny's parents, in which Vlad gained his powers. Having been a half ghost for the last 20 years, he serves as the main antagonist of the series, acting as just Danny's ultimate villain. But I mean, being a human ghost hybrid and being the reason Danny Phantom goes dark in another timeline where his family's blown up is certainly worthy of getting him on this list. Plus, I love Danny Phantom. Butch, send me a pop figure, please. I couldn't find one. In at nine, Morpheus. Morpheus first appeared in Moon Knight number 12 back in the early 80s, and he's one of like the rare horrifying characters that people actually feel sympathy for. Despite his vampiric appearance, he should not be mistaken for Morbius. This is a different person. The character who's been who's getting the standalone movie, no one knows what universe it's in. Yeah. Morbius is indeed a pseudo-vampire, while Morpheus is something else entirely. His real name is Robert Markham, and he got sick from an old virus that caused segments of his DNA to be in inhibited by the virus. He sought medical attention and Dr. Peter Alron gave him an untested drug to help him, but it all backfired, causing Markham to change dramatically appearance-wise while also taking away Markham's need for sleep and giving him unfathomable psionic powers. However, the lack of sleep rendered him crazy, after which he had taken the alias Morpheus after the Olympian God of Dreams. With his newfound powers, Morpheus sought revenge upon Alron, only to encounter Moon Knight in the process. Coming in at number 8, we have the Lord of Chaos, Dominus. 
In Enemy of Supermans, Dominus was originally a peaceful magic user on his alien homeworld, who soon became jealous when the woman he loved ascended past him and became the magical leader of their planet. Filled with envy and rage, Dominus was imprisoned in the Phantom Zone as punishment for attempting to betray his love, and over the course of his long imprisonment, Dominus soon learned to embrace the chaos of magic and managed to free himself through a gateway in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. With strength to rival the Man of Steel himself and magical abilities that can completely distort reality, Dominus is one of the most unpredictable and dangerous magic wielders in the entire DC Universe. Number 7. Scorpina Scorpina was known for being one of Rita Repulsa's most capable enforcers in the television show Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and the same can be said for her comic book counterpart. In fact, I'd even say that Scorpina is a bit more ruthless in the comics, in my opinion. She ends up becoming a somewhat reluctant and sassy ally later on, but starts out as a strong and menacing villain to the Power Rangers. Scorpina is known for her determination, expert fighting skills, and her intelligence. She initially is presented as a major enemy for Tommy Oliver, the Green Ranger, as he struggles to fight against Rita Repulsa's influence and hold over him. Scorpina would also go on to work alongside Lord Draken, the evil alternate future version of Tommy, and would later succeed him as the leader of his army. And at 6, Black Spectre. Carson Knowles was a veteran who returned home without applause. His job had been passed on and his wife left him with their son. He barely got by as a delivery man and found out his son was killed by foam. After his car was stripped for parts and a mugger accosted him, Knowles snapped and beat the man nearly to death. Seeking to destroy the city that treated him so badly, Carson Knowles ran as a dark horse candidate for mayor on his father's name and political connections. He also created a second identity as Black Spectre, beating and blackmailing the local precinct boss to support Knowles, and then in a fight with Moon Knight his mask slipped, but Moon Knight was unable to convince anyone that the mayoral candidate Knowles and Black Spectre were the same person. Eventually though, Moon Knight defeated Black Spectre in public and his assistant Marlene Arlone uncovered Knowles' corrupt plans for the city and his political office. So at least, uh, at least he lost. Coming in at number 5, we have Vandal Savage. Remember how I mentioned Eclipso is one of the oldest beings on Earth in the DC Universe? Well, Vandal Savage is also in the running, having lived through much of human history as an immortal warrior and conqueror. Seemingly unable to age and with incredible healing abilities in most depictions of the character, Vandal supposedly gained his incredible powers from the radiation of a comet that may have originally been connected to Superman's homeworld of Krypton. Regardless of how he gained his abilities, however, Savage has been a persistent enemy to the Justice League for literally thousands of years, always scheming for a new way to gain more power. In it for Nemesis. At the start of this series, the supervillain Nemesis destroys a building in Tokyo, killing a SWAT team and a police inspector. In Washington, D.C., the FBI informs Metro Police Chief Inspector Blake Morrow that Nemesis is targeting him next. Haha. <laughs> Wonderful. He is given a card reading Black Morrow, March 12th at midnight, flatline still counts. Morrow has his family put in protective custody, and then Nemesis hijacks Air Force One over the District of Columbia, taking the United States president hostage and crashing the plane. Nemesis makes an international broadcast, revealing the president as a hostage in front of him, and then finishing it off by saying, It's time you hail your new f Chief. Nemesis reveals to his henchman that his real name is Matt Anderson, and his father had committed suicide after Morrow tried to imprison him for hunting runaway teenagers with his rich friends. Bored of well behavior and less excitement, Anderson traveled around the world to learn the ways of crime, hoping to fulfill his mother's dying wish to have Morrow killed. So I think you can understand that this guy is pretty messed up and a powerful villain. Getting close to the end in number 3, Seth Falcon. He belongs to a Scottish sect of Knights Templar and has several amazing powers. I'll never do that accent again. Falcon first appeared in Mark Spector Moon Knight number 43. Seth Falcon is immortal, has superhuman strength and stamina, but his strongest power is his touch. Using his clawed fingers, Falcon can drain the life force out of any living being, aging them in the process. If he holds his grip for long enough, Seth can drain the, the entire life out of somebody, all of it, turning them into a rotted skeleton. However, there's a catch. Due to feedback, the draining process backfires if Seth uses it on anybody who shares his DNA code, even partially. Simply put, he can't drain his relatives because it causes the mm, series of issues that then hurts and weakens his powers. And yep, that's right, 
You guessed it, of course, Moon Knight turns out to be one of his long lost relatives. So, Falcon has to rely on his superhuman strength and stamina to outlast Mark Spector in any mutual fight. Which is good, because that kind of like levels the playing field. Coming in at number two, we have to go with Batman's iconic nemesis, the Joker. When you're making a list about mysterious villains, the clown prince of crime just has to be on there. Because in a way, even more extreme than Duella, we still don't know what this guy's really all about. There have been attempts over the years to give the Joker some sort of backstory, like the Red Hood incident, or when the DC Universe briefly had three entirely separate Jokers, but these stories all always seem to land on deciding that the Joker's true origin is ambiguous at best. But in all honesty, giving a 100% certain backstory to the Joker would be betraying much of his character, and leaving a bit of ambiguity? Well, that's probably for the best. Number 1, Lady Death. Because you know, one one comic book version of Death wasn't enough, so we had to do another one. Lady Death is one of the most powerful female supervillains out there, as she is literally the embodiment of death. And if you think you know about this Lady Death, you might not, because we're not talking about the one from Marvel. She hails from the bad girl comic days, where it was trendy for female characters to be bad. Whether that be bad as anti-heroes, full-on heroes, or villains. In Lady Death's case, she was mainly known as a villain. She first debuted with Chaos Comics, but has changed publishers since her initial appearance with them. Lady Death originally was the beautiful and sexy woman who seduced Ernest Fairchild into becoming a full on psychotic killer, who would later become known as Evil Ernie. As such, her first appearance was in Evil Ernie issue number one in the original black and white 1991 series. The Evil Ernie War of the Dead series finishes with Ernie managing to kill everyone on Earth in order to win Lady Death's favor. He does so by instigating an all out nuclear war, ending the story with a mushroom cloud. And then ending the story again with the mushroom cloud of his face. <laughs> This evil Ernie never dies. Number 5, Galactus. One villain who recently got a very mummy inspired looking makeover was Galactus during his time in Thor's latest series as written by Donnie Cates. Here in the first arc of the 2020 Thor series, referred to as volume 6 overall of Thor, Thor takes on the immensely powerful cosmic entity known as the Black Winter. Because the Black Winter is so powerful, Thor is forced to team up with Galactus to defeat it. Unfortunately, he also learns that Galactus is actually kind of a herald for the Black Winter. FYI, that is just how powerful of a force the Black Winter is. He has Galactus as a herald. After devouring five planets to bolster his own power, Galactus has this power stripped from him by Thor upon this revelation. Thor leaves Galactus drained of the power cosmic, wrinkled and de-armored, even taking Galactus's helmet as a trophy, using it as the entrance to his throne room. So while you might have recognized him previously, Galactus then got super upgraded and now is very mummified and also very dead. Oof. Number 4, Onslaught. Onslaught initially was a villain with a mysterious background. Despite the fact the powerful villain looked a ton like Magneto and seemed to pack a psionic powerhouse of abilities that echoed an evil Professor X, the character's true identity as really both of those mutants wouldn't be confirmed confirmed till after his initial appearance. When Onslaught appeared again, it was in a similar vein, and while the symbol of Onslaught might be similar, this time around when it came to the character's identity, they were even less recognizable as it was explained that basically all the mutants of Krakoa were in a way Onslaught, and that Onslaught was able to exist through their constant resurrections. So while you might recognize the look of Onslaught when they returned, their true identity was even more of a mystery than the first time around. And their final form that we saw during X-Men The Onslaught Revelation was pretty wild as well. Getting a bit of an update to match even the current character designs of what an amalgamated Charles and Eric would look like currently. I like that that version of Onslaught has like the black suit now, the tight black suit that Charles wears. It's a look. Number 3, One Below All. I think one of the biggest revelations of modern comics was learning that even a being as good as the one above all, who is basically considered to be like Marvel God, has a dark side. The one below all ended up being a major villain in the Immortal Hulk series, and we later learned that their power actually came from one of the most divine and good beings in the Marvel Universe, the one above all. The one below all is like the Hulk. Hulk 
for the one above all. In other words, they're darker and much more destructive other half. So while you might know the one above all and you might know the one below all, I bet you'd be surprised to learn that they were actually directly connected to one another. They can't exist without the other, especially given how different in appearance and alignment they both are. But this revelation was also super powerful and fitting for a series that was really all about forgiving and reconciling the darker side of the Hulk, the Hulks, and ultimately of humanity and our own individual selves. After all, we all have like a little bit of a Hulk side to us. Number two, Killmonger. If you go on far enough back, Eric Killmonger easily becomes one of Marvel's villains you would not soon recognize. And that goes both ways. Whether we're talking about more recent fans looking back in comic history to his first appearance in Jungle Action, volume number two, or whether we're talking about his initial fans looking at his modern MCU adaptation and comic redesign, which obviously takes inspiration from the MCU version of Eric. Killmonger made his first appearance in the second volume of Jungle Action from the 1970s in issue number six. And even from that front cover, he just looks like really different. Here, Eric does not sport any self-created bodily scars marking his kills, but instead comes with a lot of spiky accessories, including what appears to be a spike belt, which he uses as a weapon to fight against his foe and his rival, Black Panther. All the spikes. Now he's got scars, but back then he had spikes. Number one, the leader. I doubt after all this time if the leader even really recognizes himself considering what he looks like now. Following the events of Immortal Hulk, the leader is left no longer a supervillain, but just a guy. Throughout the course of the series, we saw the leader only grow more evil and more powerful, it seemed. He was eventually basically influenced or possessed by the one below all, the most powerful of all Hulk-related baddies, and possibly the baddest of the bad just in general. However, after the two beings were separated from one another, Stearns was left as just a man, returned to normal. The Hulk decided to forget forgive the leader and he returned back to the earth with all the other Hulks and Bruce Banner. It's been a long time, but Sam Stearns is no longer the leader, at least not currently in the comics. I mean, he could return to being the leader at some point. Instead, Samuel Stearns is just Samuel Stearns. Number three, slide. A chemical engineer turned super thief decked out in a super slippery suit. All right, let's, let's, let's get it over with. Jalome Bleacher created a chemical coating that basically eliminated the friction between an object and any surface it came into contact with. Which, not even joking here, that could be really, really useful. Like, good job, man. <laughs> Too bad the company he worked for closed their R&D department and Jalome had to find a way to independently fund this project. Honestly, I, I would have just found another company who wanted to fund me, but then I wouldn't appear on a list of people you never heard of, and that is a goal of mine. He created a suit with the chemical and used his slippery abilities to rob banks and try to destroy his old boss's business. His only other notable mentions were his midlife crisis and his death in a side story of the Civil War event where he was shot in the back for refusing to side with crime boss Hammerhead. I guess you could say that they had some friction. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna slide my way to the door. Number two, Stilt Man. So long as I am the master of my stilts, I'm unbeatable. I'm completely invincible. <laughs> um, Wilbur, just, just stop. Just stop, man. Despite being an adversary to both Daredevil and Spider-Man. Stilt Man just couldn't seem to be taken seriously. I can't possibly imagine why. Oh wait, no, 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 I can, I can. It's, it's the stilts. Yeah, 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 it's the stilts. What's interesting is that if you go into his Marvel Wiki page, Stilt Man actually has quite a long history being involved in many storylines. And his stilts are actually pretty strong. At one point, the strength of them was able to plunge She-Hulk so far into the ground, she ended up in the subway. But then she beat him in a really embarrassing way. I mean, just look. His stilts could reach up to 290 feet though, which is actually kind of cool, I think. Number one, Hypno Hustler. Okay, just, just look. Look at this dazzling man. What an icon. The Hypno Hustler made his debut in the 80s, which I hope isn't a surprise to 
anyone. He uses a hypnotic guitar to hypnotize people, wears headphones that stop him from hypnotizing himself, and has boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives. What a combo! His story involves him performing at the nightclub Beyond Forever, where Peter Parker and pals just happen to be. Him and his band use their hypnotic grooves to hypnotize the crowd into giving up their goods. Peter Parker, being the hero, obviously knows what's going on and changes into his Spidey suit. During the fight, he realizes the headphones are the only thing keeping Hypno Hustler from hypnotizing himself, and Spider Man removes them. That's it. Fight over. Coming in at number 10, we have Eclipso, the alleged former Wrath of God. A supernatural agent of chaos with his face permanently in the shade of a constant eclipse, Eclipso claimed to be the one who carried out the biblical flood of Noah's Ark and that he was replaced in his position as the physical embodiment of God's wrath by the specter because Eclipso was just too violent and angry for the role. Older than almost every other being on Earth, Eclipso has fought many heroes over the years and even though he no longer possesses the power of a full god, he is still an extremely dangerous magical being, and who knows what he'll do next to try and regain his power. Number 9. Hazirul Hazirul is the demon who possesses the leader of the Rat Queens, Hannah. Hannah is an elven necromancer in the series whose very existence as well as the type of magic she practiced made her controversial while growing up. As such, she ends up making a pact with the demon Hazirul to get access to magic so that she can pass her classes at Mage U. This prompts her to grow horns and also makes her indebted and permanently bonded to the demon. Using such dark magic has consequences, of course, and when she taps into it, it can cause Hannah to go, uh, kind of into a pretty crazy frenzy, losing control over herself as her darker side and the demon within her takes over. In Rat Queens, Hannah was prompted to use this power again to save her friends and fellow Rat Queens after years of resisting the temptation of said demonic power. Unfortunately, this also meant she would have to confront Hazirul after years of staving off the demon's power and influence. In a way, Hazirul is also like a symbol for Hannah's own inner demons, though he is himself literally a demon with his own wants and desires, <laughs> both a symbol and an actual demon. Mainly, he loves Hannah and he wants to continue to be as close to her at any cost. Which is obviously not very good for her, but Hannah also has a lot of shit that she needs to work out, so yeah. <laughs> and it ain't Count Nefario. While Count Nefario wasn't purely evil at first, his desire for more wealth and power is ultimately his downfall, and he's very nefarious. He has been around for years and years, fighting almost every single Avenger he can think of. He also encountered Moon Knight after Mark Spector moved to LA and joined the West Coast Avengers, primarily becoming his villain. Count Nefaria is immortal and has an unfathomably strong healing factor, because you know, he's a Immortal. He received energy projection from the living laser, strength from Power Man, and speed from Whirlwind, all amplified a hundred times. He can lift well over a hundred tons, fly over 5,000 miles per hour, teleport, leech another person's energy, and so much more. However, it, it, it's likely that if you are a fan of Moon Knight, you knew about this guy, so he's not very high on the list. But honestly, not having known much about Moon Knight before this list, aside from he looks freaking awesome, all these villains are pretty new to me, so it's pretty cool getting to see all the characters that this guy has faced, and hopefully you at least hear about a few that you didn't know about. But no complaining if you're a Moon Knight super fan, okay? That's not all up. That's cheating. Coming in at number 7, we have the Reverse Flash. A walking time paradox, the Reverse Flash hails from a 25th century where the Flash is remembered as one of the greatest heroes of all time. Becoming obsessed with Barry Allen, the Reverse Flash was eventually able to gain control of the negative speed force and made it his life's goal to replace and destroy Barry after realizing he was destined to be defeated by him. Capable of traveling through time, Reverse Flash would wind up being responsible for nearly every bad thing that ever happened in Barry's life, raising a whole lot of questions about cause and effect and all sorts of timey-wimey weirdness, but mainly going to show that he's a dangerous and unpredictable villain. And at six, death. We all love a good rendition of death, right? Of course we do, that's like the foundation of any good comic storyline. Well, in East of West, the whole story is about death, with this version of the Horseman being the protagonist of the series. And not only is he the Horseman of Death, but they're actually a Horseman as well, considering how East of West is Wild West themed. However, this time around, Death, formerly of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, fell in love with someone named 
Xyloan, something like that. I probably butchered it, but oh well. And then had a son with her, which is a whole other can of worms. Presumably killed by Bell Solomon of the Chosen, though. He survived with the help of Wolf and Crow. Since then, the White Horseman embarked on a quest for revenge over his wife and son. In the most recent incarnation, Death possessed skin that was jet black instead of the pure white skin that he has now. He was also the only horseman who didn't get a gender change in the new reincarnation. Alright, I mean, it's Death, so Death is genderless. But, I mean, he may be good in the story, though, but I think it's safe to say that Death before the series was a, a pretty, well, like, death loving guy. Self love. Halfway through into number five, Shadow Knight. Shadow Knight's real name is Randall Spector, Mark's younger brother. He was envious of Mark his entire life, which turned him into a horrible criminal. There was a murderer on the streets killing nurses called the Hatchet Man, so Moon Knight used his girlfriend Marlene as like bait to catch the killer. The plan worked, but Marlene perished. Yeah, and to make matters even worse, the Hatchet Man was revealed to be Randall. Randall later joined the of Khonshu, which ultimately resulted in him receiving the same powers as his brother Mark. However, he ended up choosing to use them for evil, donning the pseudonym Shadow Knight. Because, you know, every character needs to have a reverse version of themselves. Reverse Flash, Dark Archer, Bizarro. It was devastating for Mark to fight his brother and ultimately kill him by slitting his throat with a throwing crescent. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get much worse than that, especially when you learn that Mark tried protecting Randall their entire lives. But then again, he killed your girlfriend, so... Coming in at number four, we have the Emperor of Shadow, aka another evil Bruce Wayne from the Dark Multiverse. In a very recent one-off issue entitled Batman slash Superman Authority Special, Batman discovers a reality from the Dark Multiverse where Ra's al Ghul's plan to dominate humanity has come to pass, and the League of Shadows has become an empire of shadows, controlling the entire world. To make matters worse, the leader of this empire is a Bruce Wayne who gave in to Ra's al Ghul's teachings and embraced his position as the world's new emperor. While Batman and Superman were eventually able to destroy the link between this world and the regular DC universe in order to prevent an invasion, this twisted version of Bruce Wayne is still out there, likely biding his time until the next opportunity arises for the Dark Multiverse to attack the regular multiverse once more. Number 3. Dracula I think Dracula is a really important villain of Vampirella's to talk about since he also just surprisingly married her. In Priest's Vampirella series, he had these two longtime enemies tie the knot recently, shaking things up completely. I know when I heard about this going down, I was like, what? <laughs> Actually, a lot of Freeze Run has been shaking up the status quo and the world of Vampirella in interesting, exciting, and of course, bloody ways. Of course, the version of Dracula we see in this series isn't the conventional one that you're used to seeing when it comes to Vampirella's comics. This version of Dracula is a reincarnation that is attempting to cheat fate by marrying Vampy, thereby altering his destiny and hopefully saving his life. For years in the comics, though, Vampirella's nemesis Drac was often posed as the lord of a bunch of evil vampires vampires, with all the vampires kind of coming from his blood lineage being corrupt in some way. It was like he only made bad vampires. That was like a whole thing. Dracula has also been shown in the past to be an exiled vampire from the planet Draculon, Vampirella's home world. Of course, Dynamite isn't the only publisher to feature Dracula. While we might be focusing on the vampy version and his long, long history there, Dracula has also appeared throughout multiple different series spanning across various different publishers. And if you're like, man, but I already knew about Dracula. I don't know if you knew about his connection to Vampirella, but now you do. Yay! Penultimately, in at number two, Cactus. Sometimes a name is just a name. It can have meaning or it could just be something cool that the guy thought of that ended up kind of making sense. Other times names are extremely direct and are probably too on point. That's the case with Cactus, who is exactly what he sounds like and nothing more. Created by Dominus, he's been a villain of the West Coast Avengers and Moon Knight on various occasions. Punching him definitely stings, but beyond that, it, it doesn't take all that much to, to, to break him. Or chop him up, because, you know, he's a cactus. Which has actually happened before, though he can regenerate lost limbs. Which I don't know if cactuses can do, or cacti can do, but... Yeah, he's without a doubt one of the lamest villains in the Marvel Universe, but in my opinion, that makes him one of the coolest. This guy is literally a cactus, and that's hilarious. 
A couple years ago, the girl I was with at the time and I came up with a superhero that we called Cact Guy, who was basically in essence Cactus. And we didn't know that it was actually a thing, but it's funny to me that someone actually made this and then put it in the goddamn Marvel Universe. That's hilarious. That's amazing. And Cactus is my new favorite villain ever because of that. Cacti hashtag Cactus in the MCU. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Perpetua, the dark goddess of the multiverse. The DC multiverse has faced many threats over the course of its existence, with the highest stakes being reserved for events labeled as a crisis. But beyond the scope of even the crisis on infinite Earths is Perpetua, the mother of the Anti-Monitor and a being that, until recently, was locked behind the Source Wall at the very, very edge of the DC Universe. The creator of every story we've ever been told throughout all of DC Comics, Perpetua altered and manipulated the multiverse for her own purposes and to thwart the mysterious hands that seemed to be even beyond her own power level. We still don't know everything there is to know about Perpetua, even if she was eventually able to have her plans stopped, and the sheer scale of her ambitions makes her the most mysterious DC villain of all.